This is the uh, OGM weekly call on Thursday, June 30th, 2022. Today uh, in our alternating schedule is a topic call. I'm going to turn on the transcript as well. There we go. Um, yeah, and, and I just started reading um, a very good book about uh, internal family systems, IFS. Uh, it's written by the creator of IFS. And uh, the title is No Bad Parts. Um, and just the intro was actually very clarifying and helpful. It's just really clearly written. Uh, and uh, so IFS basically says that there we um, our personalities are constituted of sub sub personalities that they call he calls parts and these parts are busy trying to be helpful and often they get dysfunctional and uh, figuring out how to harmonize those parts is a huge piece of the process of IFS but when you overlay this on other sort of approaches to living it's really interesting because it, it gives you good information about why things happen and a piece of the intro is a little bit of a critique of sort of Buddhism in a way. Um, and I'm not going to get it right. So I should go back and find the quote. Uh, but he, he says very often what we try to do is sort of suppress many of our parts and or master them. Like willpower is like a big thing. How do you get willpower? How do you master yourself? And he's like, you know, in doing so, you just often crank up the volume on the problem that your parts are having. And his approach is like, try to figure out how to talk to your parts and then uh, get them to collaborate. And he says sometimes, and the reason it's called no bad parts is that he believes that even people whose parts make them cut themselves or kill people or be addicted, that those parts really would rather be doing something else. Those parts are, 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 are acting in that way because of something that happened in that person's life. Uh, and they think they have to. And that often the bad parts will, once once sort of heard and recognized and harmonized a bit, the parts will then change a lot and will pick up a different role. And will it turns out that they're not bad parts after all. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Parts is parts. So anyway, um, hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, so uh, topics, thoughts. Could be anything. Could be like how to make a miniature remote control aircraft out of paper and toothpicks. It could be Scott. Um, this is what came to mind for me. So is the challenge, and, and you can put whatever subject matter you want into there, is the challenge more sophistication or more simplicity? In other words, is... Uh, do we need to be diving deeper to better understand what we don't? <clears throat> or do we need to be making what we already understand simpler and more shareable? And it seems like it's something that I find in these conversations and a few other groups that I've been playing around with, we tend to want to go yeah, but deeper, 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 deeper into the infinity of things we don't yet understand, which sometimes feels, I mean, it's absolutely critical to do that, but it also feels like a way to avoid picking these simple messages and getting them out into an actionable, an actionable way. Um, so I think it's it's obviously a balance, but that's something where I've noticed that the <clears throat> simpler and more shareable tends to be things that are not necessarily helpful. The things that we're making simple and sharing are antagonistic, or we need to do something, or you know something like that. So. I saw Doug raised his hand, and <clears throat> I think that frames my suggestion for the moment. Um, love your suggestion, Scott. Uh, Doug, then Stuart. <clears throat> so is that me now? I think it is. We have two Dougs on the call, sorry. So uh, it, it is okay. you. 
um, when do we stop treating the world as though it's normal and move into a crisis mode? And the two questions don't obviate each other. One could be a channel or a path to resolve the other. Um, thank you. Stuart? Yeah, so um, <laughs> what, in some ways what both Scott and, and Doug um, expressed fits into um, something that popped into my brain this morning. And that was um, in the context of um, a lot of people who have uh, a tech orientation. I remember in 1981, I was working for AT&T and PCs started to pop up on people's desks. Well, that's only 40 years ago. And look at the mass transformation since then. So how do we, how do we analogize that and create a mass trans transformation of the way human beings live in the next 40 years? Thanks, Stuart. Um, Mr. Homer. Um, this might be contentious, but Jesus fucking Christ, the Supreme Court just said Congress has to do all the science. The EPA is no longer able to regulate things. And that has implications that are amazingly potent and destructive. So how do you stay sane in a world that where all the institutions that you grew up with that you trusted just seem to be rotting and falling apart in front of your eyes. I mean, I am beyond pissed between the last couple of Supreme Court uh, announcements of their decisions and what's going on with the um, the hearings. And I, I just, I, I'm stunned. I'm, I'm, I really do not know uh, how to handle what's going on here. Um, Ken, thank you. This is called the Chevron... EPA, uh, Chevron, <laughs> oh, they're, they're reversing Chevron, essentially. It's it's uh, EPA versus Virginia or West Virginia versus EPA, something like I that. I that that had been decided today, but there's a word for this. Um, it's, it's called the Chevron deference. Yeah. Uh, Chevron deference basically says that agencies have the power to regulate and uh, SCOTUS, and correct me if I'm wrong, SCOTUS has just ruled the opposite, that agencies just don't have a lot of power. This I, I just sent a, an article from WAPO out to the OGM list so you can find it there. But uh, it's just like, here we have a court packed by a man who lost the popular vote, who was impeached twice, who clearly is not fit for, um, as as very conservative, um, what was the National Review or Washington Examiner said, you know, he's not fit for power anywhere. And um, his, his legacy, forget what he, he did to undermine the transfer of power and, and constitution, the legacy of, of installing three extremely conservative originalist justices on the Supreme Court over the objections of the majority of people. Um, I, I, I'm, I am at a loss to find a way for this country to move forward in, a, in the manner in which I grew up with um, the institutions working. It feels like they're completely corrupted now. And if the Supreme Court is not uh, impartial and is enacting an agenda of legislating from the bench, which is to say, we're going back to the way that the, the original, to the framers thought, I mean, overruling Roe v. Wade, the uh, women didn't even have the right to vote when the 14th Amendment was written. Women, and are to, men, women, women to, are never mentioned in the Constitution. Yes, so they should have no rights then. And I, I mean, just, I'm I'm really upset about what's going on right now. Thanks, Ken. Me too. Um, arguably, everything you just said is a reason why conservatives still love Trump and are not leaving his side. In that, arguably, they have made more progress in the last years since 2016 than any other conservative has in forever. Uh, and what, what I've been reading about the Federalist Society and the, the, the bench 
is that conservatives for a while thought, oh, we'll just get some conservatives on the bench and they'll legislate for us. And then there was a, there were a bunch of decisions in the 80s, 90s that weren't really conservative. And all these conservative justices were going with like, like what's reasonable. And they were like, well, that won't work. So the Federalist Society turned into a kind of quiet litmus test. If you were a member of the Federalist Society, you were sort of guaranteed to be pretty extreme on these views, but everybody knew that nobody on that <laughs> path to join SCOTUS could leave a trail. So as much as possible, you you stop, you didn't put out extreme opinions, you didn't join extremist groups, you didn't do whatever, or that was in your misspent youth. Uh, and that's how over a really long term, over a 30, 40 year strategy since I, I, 1964 is the marker in my head, when Goldwater loses, that the Republicans figure out, oh my God, we've got to actually take the long view here. And so, and so Ken, I don't think that this is the long arm of history bending backwards and breaking the elbow. I think this is uh, aspect elements at play in the arena who have made a, a, just a concerted, determined, uh, hold your nose and keep going uh, kind of effort that is paying off at this point. And the fact that it's paying off gives it more energy even as it inflames the, uh, the other side. But the other side is in disarray. And I think the question might be, how do you fight this with more complexity or with simplicity? Just to go back to Scott's start, right? So I think that there's, I think we might be able to combine some of these questions or if somebody wants to sort of recommend uh, a, a path into the conversation. But, but I, I appreciate your bringing the, very hot and very present issues that SCOTUS is dropping, the, the turds that SCOTUS is dropping on the on the tray uh, into, into our conversation, because uh, I, I feel the same way. Uh, Stacy Gill, Doug B. To Scott's original point, I don't think most people know what to do and how do we get back to learning what is the best thing to do? And to the point I made before the cameras went on, I was trying to figure out <clears throat> how do I get out of my own emotion to be able to discuss that without going on the rant that I want to go on so that we could figure out what do we do? Sometimes ranting helps. Mm -hmm. Right. But <laughs> to Scott's point, do if we just answer the first question, and I think we should because so so like so what what do we do? So we have so this decision is really important that you're talking about. So what would be the way forward, and how do we get people, regular people, on both sides to see, regardless of what your opinion is, how should we set up the process? whereby decisions are made, regardless of what party's in control. How do we even have those conversations when we're just saying, well, it's this, per you know, how do we get there? There's a, there's a term, a couple things. There's a term called regular order, which John McCain famously wanted us to go back to, and which was destroyed very intentionally as part of this long-term strategy. And regular order is bipartisan politics where there's compromises where people make deals sometimes you don't like the deals because there's pork you know and, and you know, earmarks and all that kind of weird stuff the, the how the sausage is made is not pretty but the sausage is not this extreme uh it's not habanero ghost pepper or whatever the most spicy pepper there could be just to overwork a bad analogy anyway um and and so regular order has been shredded and I, I, I all, and, and in my own narrative, I lay this at the feet of Gingrich a lot. He systematically destroyed this, but so did Tom DeLay, so did a bunch of other people in the middle. And I'm like, oh, right, because there was just an article yesterday that mentioned regular order. Um, and then secondly, there, there's a role for getting pissed off because, and I think I said this maybe two weeks ago when we talked, um, Democrats don't really do a good job of getting pissed off. And for me, there's an Oscar winning moment when Lindsey Graham gets in incensed and just curled up like he's sucking lemons and spews about Kavanaugh and how this is a lynching and so forth. And that's really intentional because he knows Kavanaugh is a bro. He knows Kavanaugh is going to vote for, you know, that overturning all these terrible liberal acts of the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and he, he, he knows 
and he believes, and he's correct, that his anger and Kavanaugh's anger will be interpreted as righteous indignation, and people will just say, okay, good, we're good, let's go. If I could just add one more yeah, thing. please. Just in case anybody is interested, something that I would really like to work on because I think we can make a difference has to do with the media because that's just the place that I think we, we have power if we work together. So I'll just leave it there. Well, the good news is that we um, now participate in the media a lot more than we ever did you know, before just the last 20 years, period done like bloggers are now actual things and and never mind everything else and podcasts and everything else so so i i might go back also to the question of um do we do we try to learn what do we try to explore where no man has gone before or do we actually take what we know and make it simpler and more useful which was another question that came up at the very beginning of this call and i love that question because that's a very ogm question it's like how do we take what we know, share it back to ourselves, and how do we bring it into spaces so that it's more so that it's more possible, even never mind easier, for us to talk about these contentious issues in a way that doesn't spiral out of control and end up at the extremes? And Stacy, feel free to jump back in if you want to. Yeah, I was just going to say even basics like calling out unidentified sources. If I have to listen to one more person that I used to respect on CNN saying, well, unidentified sources at the CIA's, I mean, at the um, at the Secret Service said, I mean, they know they're throwing in bullshit. They know it's bullshit, but they say it just to like, you know, I'm, I'm referring to the testimony of um, of saying that, you know, the whole thing with the Trump and the and the choking and saying, oh, well, this wasn't said. I mean, they're playing with they're just playing with words. And you know, if, if you're a little bit more sophisticated, you realize they're using technicality of words. But if you're not, then you, you're just throwing out fodder for people to play with and avoid just getting to the facts. And it's frustrating. And it's, yeah, I'm just, I'm fed up. <laughs> so yeah. I'm quiet now. <laughs> well, thanks, Stacey, appreciate that. Uh, Gil and Doug B. Yeah, good morning, everybody. This is a great conversation. We're we're in the questions that started getting asked at the top, and I don't think we need to resolve which one we're focusing on. They're all woven together. Um, Ken, to your observation that um, everything is rotting. Uh, thank you, by the way. I hadn't seen the news yet this morning, so you've now dropped me into the decision I've been dreading. Same here. All week since Roe, because I knew this was coming. Um, it's not rotting. It's being actively dismantled. Uh, this is not a 30 or 40 year process. This is a, this is 70 years of social progress being act, actively, strategically, systematically dismantled. Um, and we can look at the historical precedents, but this is a focused systematic campaign of a sort that the Democrats have never been able to mount with consistency. Back to the question of simplicity uh, and complexity that Scott raised at the top, uh, the Republicans have been remarkably good at staying very focused on a very narrow set of messages. Uh, the Democrats tend to talk about everything all the time. And, you know, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying that's consequential. Um, and so, uh, you know, when we talk about what do we do, the we is not just us bunch of smart people sitting here talking, but it has to be, you know, a systematic national and local organizing campaign. Uh, you know, people forget that, and we've talked about this before here, I think that Rosa Parks didn't just get fed up one day and sit down on the bus in Montgomery in exasperation. She was trained for years at the Highlander Institute, which produced a whole lot of the cadre of the civil rights movement um, in deep systematic strategic and personal training, tra Stacey, Stacey training around emotions, you know? Uh, and what do you do with emotions? You don't suppress them, you don't yield to them, but they're part, you know, they're, they're, part of how we show up in the world. We're emotional beings. You know, we're we're rational beings and we're emotional beings and we're historical beings and all that's in there. I, I'm 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 trying to stay away from the word parts, Jerry, because I, I I didn't like the introduction you made to the book about the parts not bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, critique of Buddhism sounded kind of superficial. Uh, I think Buddhism could make just the same kind of critique in reverse that. Uh, so I'm not interested in finding our parts. I'm interested in how do we as whole, as beings live in the world? Uh, and the question I'd ask to the question list is how do we live as though we actually belong 
to the living world and to each other. You know, what would that look like if we were if we were like that? Um, um, so many things flown by here. Let me just there was one other I wanted to touch on. Um, oh golly. Um, oh yeah, uh, Ken um, used the word indignation, and I think it's a really important word. I've been in a conversation with a couple of colleagues, I guess this year, about anger and rage and indignation, and the relationship and the differences between. Them. Um, and rage is, it turns out to be a quality that the ancient Greek, Greek tragedies talked about a lot as something different than anger, uh, with a different kind of grounding and a different kind of power. Uh, and um, I like the indignation when I was talking with, with, uh, with Floris, uh, I'm talking about being angry at something. He said, you're not angry. And I thought, what the fuck are you telling me what I'm thinking? He said, no, you're indignant. I thought, oh, oh, indignant, violation of dignity. Dignity is a quality of human beings that we all have potential to us. And what happens when that gets broken? And so maybe that has more potency, more generative power than just anger. And anger arises and evolves. And how do we take that and do live into that emotion um, as powerful beings able to work with other people who maybe share that or some version of it? The, the last thing I want to say here is that, um, um, Ken, I'm referencing you a lot this morning. I don't know why that is, but, uh, but, but, but Ken has been- could do worse. I could do worse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's systematically busting us for weeks, maybe months, about our use, our use of the word we, and how unreferenced and uncontexted that is in normal human conversation. We as us in this group, we as all the people like us, we as America, we as humanity, um, we huh, humans tend to be very sloppy about differentiating that. Um, and it gets messy and loses, loses some potency. And it would be good for us to be clear about that more. Um, what we do in this group, what we do as a cohort of, of you know, awake inspired progressives in America, um, um, I, I'm most struck at how narrow that circle is and how little contact I at least have, number one, with the people who I fiercely disagree with, who may actually share some of the same concerns that I have, but show up in a really different interpretation around them. Uh, and and very limited interaction with people who are you know kind of in that great big middle of sort of this sort of that maybe vote maybe don't vote um, you know the, the the political strategy is either you get your base out and get enough amount to win and just you know be in constant battle with the other side or you bring people into your base from the middle and that requires conversation and engagement and really lit deep listening to who they are and where they are and how they see the world. Um, you know, I hear from, I hear from some people on, well, let's just call it our side, a better word, who, who sort of get this and say, we really need to talk to the other side. And I would say maybe, but we also really need to listen to the other side. Because in the midst of the rage, for example, around the road decision, I've heard a few people on the anti-abortion side who have who communicate deeply heartfelt, thoughtful, anguished perspective on this issue from their point of view in a way that I could actually hear. I can't hear most of them, but I can hear some of them. Uh, and so what happens if we actually hear each other across this fierce and widening gulf that we're living in? I'll stop there. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Doug B? Uh, you're muted. First you, just, first, you disappeared from view because you lowered your hand, and I'm like, "Wait, where'd you go? Where'd you go?" And then I saw, <laughs> and then I saw your mouth moving. Sorry, I. Uh, that's sort of a perfect cue up, Gil, for where I was. I was planning on sharing. So, um, on Sunday, my my father-in-law is a army vet, and uh, he's in hospice right now. And about two months ago, he, he wanted to go to church. And my wife's family 
isn't religious, they've never been churchgoers, but if they were, it would be Lutheran. And so the church was having a Veterans Day meets, you know, fundamentalist Christian uh, service uh, celebration. And, um, and so I went to honor him. And where, Gil, where you just left off is what I was, what I experienced. I went open, I went without judgment um, to sort of be with and in the middle of. And the most powerful, palpable um, dimension of all of it was how um, fundamentally grounded they were in their fundamentals. Even if those fundamentals aren't my fundamentals, um, all of it is uh, embodied, all of it is um, rationalized, but also held on a, on a belief basis, on an emotional basis. And what struck me first was anything directed at or with the intention or energy of shifting or changing their minds made no point. <laughs> like, absolutely, that is not an effect, going to be an effective strategy. Um, presumably any more than somebody trying to do that to me and swing me over to the whatever uh, would probably not be likely to succeed. And in that recognition, the lowest hanging fruit, biggest 3,000 pound gorilla that emerged in my mind was um, how to, how can, how can the, the center of polarity, of adversity, of conflict, be um, dislodged, loosened up, opened up? How can the, the us against them um, be tackled? And, and I started thinking about it in a very tactical, practical, ground, grounded, grassroots way. Like, if that's the problem, if that's the challenge, how could, if, if we were the first groups of Gingriches and Bannons and others, if we put ourselves in a seat where they were when they started us down the path that we are now realizing and experiencing, if we took a strategic positioning and orientation and said, this is the Manhattan Project call to action. The mission is how to, in a catalytic way, trigger not um, a letting go of beliefs that are polar, that are polar, but trigger a awakening recognition of the things in common, which is actually, Gil, like what you were speaking, like we actually are human beings all. So there's vastly more that the people in that church and I have in common than the three to five things that are the center of what we don't. So energetically, intellectually, consciously, experientially, how might it be possible to just catalyze, design something that would catalyze an awakening, a pause, a like, oh, they're me, I'm them. We agree on blah, blah, blah. So that's what popped up as a call to action. 
<laughs> and and I thought about all of the mechanics today, current, present moment, because the world is, is the immediate is in the present moment. All of the modalities and learnings that we have at hand that were employed by Bannon and company in 2016 to propagate polarity and hate and fear and, diver and uh, divisiveness and bigotry. And all, of the, all of those things were proactively weaponized and implemented using all the technology and online and social media and regular media and messaging and like state-of-the-art practice. The data mining, the, the getting granular down to the household, all of that stuff. And I was like, well, what if we took the same approach, use the same tool and methodology, but in service to creating a catalytic moment of everybody being confronted with the things in common. So I'm gonna stop there. I mean, I've actually done a bunch of noodling, drilling down into what would that look like? But um, I, I put that on the table because in the scheme of what's needed right now and what's been proven can be done in, in turning massive numbers of people against each other. You know, what if a campaign by design could be figured out by a bunch of smart, creative people um, to uh, do the opposite. With that, I'll stop. Thanks, Doug. Um, and there are many movements and organizations that are trying to take the approach you described. Uh, I, I have I posted a link to uh, bridging the cultural divide in my brain. I collect them there. Uh, I just posted Joe Cox's quote. Uh, there's a, a, a group called More in Common. There's a whole bunch of others. Uh, and maybe one thing we could do is take a deeper and longer excursion into that space. Uh, that might be fruitful. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mark then Klaus. Yeah, you know, I, I put up the Sun Tzu quote because to me it really epitomizes the 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 problem that that we that we're talking about and that we have. A lot of things can be part of strategy, but um, you know, in, in hearing some of the different pundits about the recent court decisions, you know, one interesting piece of analysis was that you know Democrats Democrats have an abortion problem, they have a gerrymandering problem, they have a climate problem, blah 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 blah. They have all these problems that they're running around trying to tackle. The, the Republicans have a strategy for changing the Supreme Court, and and that that solves all their problems, uh, in in effect. And you know, it, it it really in the climate space, for example, I can distinctly remember conversations thirty years ago with sort of leading environmental people, leading NGOs, about the topic of of climate change education in the schools, and and the answer was we don't have time for that. This is an emergency. And so it, 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 the, the, it, on the climate side, we are constantly simply recreating the charge of the light brigade. And, and it's always an emergency. And it's always, we gotta do this. And even today, you know, everybody says, well, all we have to do is go out and vote in, in, in the midterms or in 2024, think? vote climate. We oh, well, no, the, shaker. Good the evening, system, sir. how are you? The system is broken. It, it's fine. Is it it's Gil. No, Can it's you mute Gil? Just did. Thank you. Thanks. I was but, looking around to figure out whose whose window was lighting up, and I couldn't tell. Thanks. But but you know, there's a great book, The Industry of Politics, that sort of documents how the system is broken, and that you know the votes of 98 percent of the people in the U.S. literally don't matter at this point. And and so I it 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 really is frustrating that that we, we're, we're, we're totally tactical on the left. And there's, I, I'm not aware of strategy and maybe there's strategy going on behind the scenes that I'm simply not privy to, but we're not, certainly not seeing a lot of benefit of that, of that strategy. Um, and by the way, I don't know if, if anybody's mentioned it, I came in a little bit late, I apologize. But uh, if you've heard about what the court has accepted for next year in terms of the North Carolina carries, um, 
you know, that case, depending on how they decide it, will remove all judicial oversight from state elections. So the legislatures will be able to do whatever they want with elections in their states and without any oversight of any kind. And, and they just accepted that case this morning for, um, for next year. So it, 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 the, this ride is not over quite yet. By far. Just starting. Um, but you said a moment ago, uh, Mark, that Republicans have a strategy for changing the Supreme Court and that solves other problems in effect. Um, my understanding is that this strategy is in fact kind of a plan D. It's like a last ditch effort because they realize that the popular vote on most of these issues would swing the other way. And so they tried a bunch of different things. Uh, and finally figured out that the only place where they could get leverage and basically get minority rule is by packing the court, by taking over state legislatures, by doing a bunch of things that they actively did. Um, but, and I agree a lot, and thank you for crispening it in my head, that at least they've got a strategy and an offense and they know what they're doing and they make sure that they keep everybody in line on that offense and the offense is paying off. Right. Well, I mean, just to give one very quick example, you know, 10 years ago when when my son was sort of getting into the professional workforce and starting to get jobs in the political arena and et cetera, he said, you know, the Republicans have have this entire um, minor league system for identifying and and promoting and helping young people in that world advance and and bringing them forward. And et cetera. and he said, you know, the liberals don't have anything in that space. Uh, and uh, as he was out sort of surveying the, the neighborhood. So it's just, it, it may, I, I'm not sure, I mean, if it's a successful strategy, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a strategy based on what wasn't working. They came up with a strategy that would work and they've been pursuing it in all kinds of ways for many, many years. Um, and, and we're sort of asleep at the wheel. It's, it, it, I, I don't know how you change that. Agreed. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Klaus? Klaus, your audio is not, not very clear. I don't know what's wrong, but uh, we're not hearing you very well. Okay. Um, can you hear me better now? Uh, you sound like your you sound like whatever your microphone is. It's not actually connected to the. Sounds like the wrong mic. Yeah, the wrong is mic. It, if you go, is this better? not yet. <laughs> that screen was good, but still not not that clear. <laughs> you'd, you'd be better off right this minute just talking over your laptop and switching to the system microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm on my laptop, so it should. Is that uh, working now? We can hear you, but it's not the right setup. But go ahead and go ahead and, and jump in. It's probably because I have these headphones on. So, so the talking about the the uh, tactics versus strategy. Whenever the power gets concentrated in the way that it is being done or has happened now, basically a system sub optimizes itself and. The, the, when, when the system sub-optimizes itself, it loses connection, right? The interconnectedness between systems components, the communication within the system is getting lost. And that, the, the idea that Republicans are the, the, you know, the, the, the probably corporate and financial the, the, the power folks have is that they just know better. They just just move stuff out of the way. And I, I have an example. My son is a uh, uh, corporate uh, the employer, he's a manager, he's, he's in employer branding, corporate employer branding, uh, of corporate employer branding. And that position is, is, has been created, it's brand new, it's under marketing. The reason that this position is now has now become necessary is because basically the unions have been completely disempowered, right? So the communication within an organization, when you look at a larger organization, has gotten lost, and there are legitimate reasons for having a union. So if you have a manager running a department in ways that disenfranchises the employees or creates a lot of issues and so on. That information doesn't reach senior management because 
there is no direct line of communication available. Right? So, so now uh, there has to be a, a circumnavigation of that in order to in order to find ways, and it's only coming into view because uh, employees are hard to find, particularly knowledge workers are hard to find. There's a huge amount of turnover in the industry, so they have to find ways to, to retain people. And in the absence of having representation, you know, there needs to be a different form of, uh, there needs to be a different communication channels created in Malta. And you see the same with environmental issues where companies think they have a solution, but that solution creates problems in, in the, within the system in terms of externalities in other ways. So that concentration of power always, always creates inefficiencies and, and, and creates, I, mean, the, the, I love what Mark posted there, you know, strategy without tactics versus tactics without strategy. We are doing tactics without strategy right now. You know, and, and it's a disaster because we do not have a national strategy. We cannot be unable to form a national strategy on climate change, for example, because we are sub optimized and, and, and these, these groups are paralyzing each other's actions. So, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how, how we would get around this because to, to wait until until the the impacts become so obvious, you know, that you just must act like you have a wall breaking out somewhere. Um, in in this case, I, I mean, this with climate change, we are we are have, we have reached tipping points uh, that are already irreversible, that are already running into some some pretty catastrophic uh, outcomes, inevitable. Right, so we are in a mitigation period. We need to mitigate, um, and, and we are we are we're not there. Uh, we're not able to do it. So this is what Doug is saying. When are we going into a crisis mode? Because the crisis is already on us, right? and we are we are swirling. We are we are we are unable to to pull it together. And I have no idea how to how to prove that up. Yeah. Um. Two quick thoughts. One is that. Ironically or terrifyingly, going into crisis mode is the opposite of the mode that Doug B was describing for us to actually melt what's dividing us from the people who could help us solve all these problems. So, the, and, and, and ironically, this goes right back into my internal my introduction about internal family systems. It's very strange. What I like about IFS is that it's just systems all the way down. And it turns out that our personality is a system too, and that's sort of the approach that they take. Uh, second thought is, I think, and Klaus, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and I think Pete will correct me anyway, um, the German constitution, the Grundgesetz, uh, includes rules that say any organization larger than X, maybe it's 30 people, must have labor represented on its board. Uh, it just, it's mandated, it's mandated, it's a requirement. And in the US, we've managed to dismantle, disable, and, and defang, and to totally marginalize unions. And we're so happy now when like one Starbucks unionizes. It's like everybody everybody goes huzzah, and, and the union movement is just like, like destroyed in the US, very effectively destroyed and undermined in the US because it's so inconvenient when people want more money and you can't keep everyday low prices, which is what proves that you're not a monopoly. This thing is like, you know, this, it's an robberus of, of bad decisions uh, that are that are sort of holding this whole system in place at this point and make it really hard to come back. Sorry, go ahead, Klaus. Unfortunately, that, that same phenomenon extends into any aspect. So, for example, uh, in the food business, um, you have companies who are now wanting to do fermented meats. They need source materials, which is soy or, or peas, basically, they go for these protein extracts that they're using. There's absolutely no reason for those source materials to not be corn regeneratively and to integrate the sourcing of these materials into shifting uh, uh, nature into a, a recovery mode, right? It would be a perfect opportunity to do that. They're spending billions of dollars to go in there. So I, so I was contacted by a Brazilian firm that is getting into this business from, for, for marketing. And my, my point was, why don't you use this as a different, why don't you use a differentiation of sourcing organic, you know, to, to position yourself in the market 
in their return, basically, uh, of course, we can't do it because no one else does it. That means we would we would have a cost disadvantage, which would make it difficult for us to 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 enter the market. So, in the absence of regulations, you know that that put a floor underneath all of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you have a race to the bottom, and that race to the bottom is what you see in the labor markets, what you see in the environmental markets. It's everywhere. And the most successful they are, you know, not what's just now happening in the Supreme Court, the most successful they are to take these regulatory structures apart instead of reforming them, you know, the more the more hopeless this is really getting. You know? And I'll just add into the mix of long game thinking, Citizens United, uh, which has caused some of the corruption, at least I suspect, uh, actually probably hard to prove, but unlimited financing of, of, of electoral races has led to, hey, we have the best kind of, we have the best government we can buy, uh, which is what, what's happened, right? And they can deregulate and delegislate the way, the way we're witnessing right this very minute. Uh, the, the unfolding and unwrapping of whatever constraints and whatever regs were keeping these these wheels on the track or these things heading at least in the generally right direction. So I'm with you. Uh, Mr. Carmichael. I think it's not correct to say that the Democrats don't have a strategy. I think they do have a strategy. It's powerful and it's working. And it's basically the strategy of concentrating in Wall Street and big corporations, big money. The Democratic Party, as the party of the workers, became the party of the bankers. Uh, the Clinton administration is probably one of the key focal points for that. So we actually have no party that represents public interest. Uh, the Democrats are not there. And because they're persisting in where they're going, have been going, uh, they run the danger of, of losing the next election. End of thought. Thanks, Doug. Ken? Perfect segue, Doug. Thank you. That was just the perfect tee up for what I was going to say, which is that the historical narrative of democracy for the last 240 years has been about how great America is, but the historical narrative of capitalism has been about how great money is. And the two of them are not compatible in the long run. And there are now, as has been mentioned on this call and numerous other times, you know, dating back to uh, as soon as FDR won, you know, they started to figure out well, how are we going to undo the New Deal? This is terrible. This is socialism, right? And um, for the Powell memo and just so many things, Newt Gingrich, uh, the whole Reagan revolution has all been about dismantling the um, regulation of business. This is this is about unfettered business. The Supreme Court is now um, deciding uh, with with um, what the West Virginia versus EPA, we're not going to let um, any non congressional body regulate business in any way. I think that is kind of the, the bottom line for the Supreme Court is we're going to undo every possible regulation. And that really is incompatible with um, sustainability, life on a, on a, a sustainable planet, because that's just going to give permission to, to burn up all the coal, all the oil, anything we want. So we're faced with an existential choice. And, you know, my understanding, and I'm, I'm not an historian the way that Doug is, and I, I have I've read the Constitution a couple of times, but it's been years. I believe Jefferson and others, I don't want to just put it all on Jefferson. And, of course, we have to actually look at the, the whole Iroquois Confederacy underlying the whole system of governance that we have. But um, Jefferson and others foresaw that sooner or later it would become corrupt and we would need a mechanism to um, reconstitute our government. I, I no longer give my consent to the United States government as it is currently constituted to be the government for my life. They, I don't think they're acting in my best interest. I don't think they're acting in community's best interest. I don't think they're acting in the nation's best interest. I don't think they're acting in the planet's best interest. I'm sure there's many other people who join me in that. So what is the way that we can nonviolently and wisely reconstitute a government where we would give our consent to be governed. Well, strangely, um, this is going to sound like me promoting us, but um, in my head, 
a reason for OGM is to actually have us come back into community, come back into mutual decisions, base our decisions on data from a grassrootsy kind of level, and then come back up and infect electoral process and educations and science and journalism and civic participation and all those things. I'm inspired a little bit by, uh, I think I've told the story a long time ago, but um, in the early days of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales gave a talk in San Francisco, which I attended, and he said, uh, and he said, uh, a couple of days ago, I got a lot of congratulatory emails because a week ago, uh, uh, because the Pope just got elected, and this is Pope Benedict, and uh, journalists were writing saying, "God, impressive how good a page Wikipedia created on Pope Benedict," and he laughed, and he's like we had a really deep page on every cardinal that was up for election and a whole bunch of others. All somebody did when the white smoke went up was change the name of the page and, the, and, the, and, and add something to the first paragraph that said, on this date, he was elected Pope by the Cardinal, the Council of Cardinals and, uh, and took the name Benedict the 13th or whatever, right? That's it. And, and, and there was this shared memory that everybody had been working on that was really rich and so forth. And it, it had stood the test of time and whoever was trying to affect, affect the page, there's lots of conflict there, but, but all of that conflict and all of that process was just embedded in the community that was curating this knowledge. And Wikipedia, because it's just an encyclopedia is limited, doesn't do enough for us, even though it's a phenomenal asset. So I think one of the answers here is sharing what we know and doing so with people who disagree with us and respectfully listening to them and their arguments and saying, well, can we can we just complexify this and look over here and let's let's spend a week or a month uh, just on this set of issues or set of concepts or something like that. I don't know, but but the irony is that we're in a we're in a state of emergency and the proper behavior is to act very quickly and to remedy this. And at the same time, trying to do that will cause immediate, abrupt uh, negation by the other side. Uh, in Aikido, um, when you're doing a throw, you don't want to telegraph what throw you're doing because na uh, your nage, who's uh, uke, attacks you, your nage. And when 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 you're starting the throw, you want to sort of be, you could go any place because the moment they know where you're going, they're going to resist that particular action. They're going to block it and stop it. Um, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of things at hand there. Um, Stuart. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, and I put some of these in the chat, that beneath the um, anger and, indignant, and indignity, um, and I know that I'm feeling this, there's an extraordinary and deep sadness and disappointment. Um, anybody who works with conflict knows and understands that. Deep sadness, deep disappointment, um, all the foundations that we grew up with are just kind of um, totally crumbling. And so we are in an emergency situation, as Doug <clears throat> mentioned earlier, not just in the US, but you know, we have all of these amazing you know, global challenges. And I agree so much with what Doug B said uh, about having much greater levels of commonality than difference. And so how is it that we can bump the conversation up to get people to let go of all of their current thinking, which is right, wrong, fault, blame, them, us, other, and just drop all of that stuff and realize, aha, we have a challenge as a species. Um, a lot of it is kind of self-imposed, but that doesn't, it doesn't matter what the cause is, whether it's internal or whether it's some external great challenge. And it's time for everybody to just kind of really bump up. And the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that quickly enough so that we can ward off the incredible level of damage that's going to be wreaked upon all of us and the dystopian world that we're going to be living in if we do not act. And I, you know, I don't know what the action is, but as I said earlier, you know, we transformed our world in the last 40 years. How can we do it again at this, at this, at this particular um, juncture? 
It's true. Thank you. In the interest of simplicity and, <laughs> conver and, and conversation, um, you just reminded me, uh, Dave Gray of X-Plane, who is a really nice visualizer of ideas and so forth, uh, created a deck of cards years ago that he was using as a diagnostic tool for clients. And his deck of cards, each card was like a thing that might be going on inside your organization. Uh, some of them were dysfunctional, some of them were functional. And he would hand the deck of cards to a prospect and he would say, sort these into two piles. One pile is the stuff that you see happening in your company and the other pile is the stuff that's just not here. And that was just a fantastically clear way of getting to um, a conversation that was really interesting. It was like super, super cool. Um, and I'm wondering, there's a set of beliefs that we have many of which we don't have articulated. We don't know that we have them, but we'd be like, yeah, that one. It would be fun to have a deck of cards that, that contains all the set of beliefs of the mixture of progressive and conservative beliefs and others all mixed in and see if that goes anyplace. And it doesn't mean it, it would be fun to have, materialize it as a deck of cards, but it could easily be a website where you just sort A from B and then come into conversation or something like that. And likely somebody's already doing something like this in different ways, but um, but trying to surface the unspoken assumptions that stand behind our firmly held convictions, I think is a useful exercise. Um, Doug C, then Doug B, we've got to run a Doug's. So uh, we keep looking for things to do to try and help out. But maybe the reality is that things falling apart is actually in our favor for a while things have to fall apart in order to reorganize. It's going to be very difficult, but boy, it's going to be very difficult anyway. So maybe that's important. My second thought is, I'm just wondering about our conversation here. Are we under some set of rules that we're not following? Which rules are you referring to right now? Well, I have, if we started out with, we're going to choose a topic, we'd want to go around and get proposals for topics and then come to some kind of consensus. I think it was Gil done is act yeah. as generally as though we've already chosen the topic and each person is taking their slice of it. Sort of. And I think Gil at some point uh, early on said, it seems like these topics are interwoven and they're, we're kind of working on all of them and that's okay. And I kind of went along with that. So I skipped the, hey, let's narrow down on one and go that way. And would love to hear from anybody else whether that worked or didn't work for you, if this was gone too broad and we should have narrowed down or something else. Uh, and Doug, I appreciate you bringing up roughly a point of order. Um, there being no strong feelings about that, um, if you don't mind, uh, I'll, I'll go to the next Doug in the queue. So, so where you just went is, is, is sort of where I landed, which was, what if you could come up with 15 statements, belief statements, um, that are subject matter specific, thematically specific, that both ends of the poles most extreme ends of the polls would instantaneously and rapidly embrace. And you were to design a campaign targeting each extreme because each has their own channels, their own media, their own echo chambers, their own silos. And you were literally to do a media is the message, do a subsidized, resourced, organized, data-driven campaign to plant those statements uh, in the belly of the beast of both of those poles so that they start to appear, they start to be echoed, they start to be featured by um, lots of people, the usual suspects and the usual channels completely independent of each other because they never cross-reference or look at the other. And you were to do that over a sustained long period of time. And you were to pick your shot and target your moment where you actually then introduce and stand up 
the fact that the same meme, the same belief is held and endorsed by both. So that there, there's, it's sort of irrefutable that there are things in common. And that was sort of like the simplest, most reductionist idea I could come up with in a pure media, tactical, mechanical way to, br to break the ice, to create a moment of, it, it's a disruptive moment. It's not an advocacy moment, but it's a confrontation with um, something that is cognitively discontinuous. How can I have my hatred of the other and have this and 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 this in common with the other and um, create applause. Um, and, and I think, you know, there are probably a dozen variations on the theme, other ideas in the same spirit. But the technology, the media, the phenomenology of the times that we're living in, the channels we're living in, the means to affect massive catalytic moment are there. And, and the current, the last hearing, the young woman from uh, the last hearing is proof. Like, just it was a mix of a whole bunch of dimensions that people that have expertise in media could analyze and break out for you for why her persona, her energy, her presentation, and what she shared and the words she chose to share it and all of that has has made that really start to break things up, at least in relation to Trump. So like, we can do that for the white wolf. <laughs> um, Anyway, I'll stop. Thanks, Doug. Um, Ken, then Stuart. So um, I probably told this story before. I was once asked to host a gathering of business people and peace activists. And it's like, uh, this is really not a good thing because you know it's tough to get those people to talk to each other. And the way I, I entered into the conversation was to have people sit at tables for and tell the story of the first time that they realized peace was important to them. And after two rounds of that, there were no longer peace activists as business people. There were people who were concerned about peace. So I think a lot of what um, we're talking about here has to do with, and, and I like Dave Gray's idea of, of the cards, but I've, as a facilitator, I've learned wherever you point people's attention in the group, it grows in their awareness. So I don't wanna point our attention at what divides us. I wanna point our attention at what our common concerns are. I wanna point attention at, at why we're concerned about things and what that means to us and hear stories long before we ever get to trying to fix anything. Just this, which is why I always begin with listening with people. I use the breath and listening exercise and have people listen for what's alive. What does it feel like to, to hear this other person? Where are they impressing you? Where is that impinging on your body? You go, oh my God, I really feel that, you know, because we have to create empathy before we can move into any kind of solution. And we have to have empathy and understanding of what we're facing. And these are not things that you find on Facebook groups. Stacy may be the exception to this, I don't know, but um, I think these happen best in relatively small groups of somewhere between 10 and 50 people. Maybe, you know, I could do a cafe for a few hundred on this, but um, I think they happen best face-to-face -face where it could be done on Zoom, but it's, it's gonna require breakout rooms of people really deeply listening to each other and staying in the, why is this important? Why is it important to you? And that might take months of conversation before you can say, now, what do you want to do about that? Because when, as soon as you get into what you want to do, then you get the contention. As long as you can stay with the really listening. And my guess, because I don't have this, I haven't done this a long term to know for sure, but my guess is if we did that, um, people would start to soften their positions a lot around what's required. You know, they'd, they'd be much more open to hearing other people's perspectives if they knew, wow, I've listened to this guy and or this woman and I really get where they're coming from and I feel them and I, I think they've got something that I can relate to. Because as long as it's an other, as long as it's somebody who you're whatever, you hold that position that is antithetical to mine and therefore I'm going to delegitimize your position. 
position. I'm not going to allow you to be in my life. Then I can do anything to you. I can I can become someone who's a horrible person to you. So um, maybe we need to start having conversations around how do we depolarize? And the depolarizing starts with uh, yes, thanks for dehumanization because essentially that's at the root of all of our problems. As soon as we dehumanize somebody, we're we're really you know so rehumanizing and depolarizing conversations would be an excellent um, approach to starting to work through some of these problems. Again, stepping into that imaginal space of what is it like for you and what's important to you rather than what do you think is wrong? Because what do you think is wrong is the wrong freaking question. Agreed. Stuart, do you have your hand up from before or are you in the queue? You're muted right now. I'm in the queue. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the queue to kind of punctuate a couple of things. Um, the chunking up piece where we find the commonality um, is, is critical. What's also critical, I think, is some kind of a vehicle that um, enables people to explore what's driving them, what's driving them. Each one of us has a driver. <laughs> it was implanted perhaps unconsciously, perhaps consciously, but it's present. And those drivers create the dissonance between different groups in terms of you know othering and what what's critical here is is to is to get more and more people to unplug their driver and realize there is a bigger important concern here because if they keep operating on that driver that was uh, uh, motivating them you know 25 or 50 or 75 years ago um, it's going to kill them all right, we're all, we're, we are all gonna be dead. So those drivers and the metrics with which they measure their value will not mean anything. We are in a new world. We're in a new world and we need to invent and we can invent because we understand and know what to do. How can we change people's internal thinking? I, you know, many people on this call probably, um, know more than me about the resistance to technology when it was first introduced into the population. And boom, all of a sudden, it's like massive and present. And you know we're all like cyborgs to some degree uh, moving around the earth. Well, that's the kind of movement uh, that, that, that we need. And we have the capacity and understanding um, to do that. Uh, we need to just shift all of our languaging. Um, you know, Democrat, Republicans, it's just, it's, it, in, in some ways it's, it's all silly because there are much bigger uh, at stakeness and much bigger vistas and perspective that we all need to have. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to put um, in the chat. Uh, one thing is regarding resistance to, uh, te to technology and technological change, and then also overcoming that. Uh, when cars first came out, they were noisy and they scared the horses. So many states instituted red flag laws where a person carrying a red flag had to walk 30 feet ahead of the car or 60 feet or something to <laughs> warn the people in horses and buggies that there was a car coming and that their, their horse might get spooked. Um, then... Uh, different technology. Uh, American Tobacco hired Eddie Bernays, one of the fathers of public relations, to make smoking among women uh, popular in public because half the population wasn't out smoking cigarettes in public. So there was this huge market untapped. So he called some of his debutante friends uh, uh, and, and, and colluded with them, called the press and said, gosh, I hear something's up on the, on the Easter parade coming up soon. And then on a signal in the middle of the Easter parade, these, these young, elegant women drew out cigarettes and lit up. And they called it the Torches of Freedom March. I will just point to the interesting ironies about freedom, liberty, all those things as being a trope that gets used a whole bunch. Then separately, I wanted to do uh, a, a quick screen share because um, one of the important thoughts in my brain, which I've shown here before, is that we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads, and we always have been. This is my junior varsity amateur version of history. 
that history really is a fight over the narratives, the scripts that we have running in our minds. And these scripts, uh, as Stuart just said, are overpowering, really overwhelming. Uh, this, the stories we believe, here's another thought, our beliefs uh, shape what we see. Uh, not, not just sort of what we say, uh, but, um, but what we see. We, we will miss evidence that's right in front of us if it doesn't fit our beliefs. Uh, but this titanic battle is the battle that we've been sitting here talking about for two years in OGM uh, in, in many different ways. And finding clever ways to undermine it, deflate it, bypass it, step past it, through it, uh, I, I think is hugely important to solving the problems that we're, that we're busy talking about here. Uh, Bernays was, in fact, Freud's nephew. There's a whole really, actually, let me screen share again for Bernays. He's completely worth uh, knowing more about. Uh, he is has no relationship to the sauce, uh, he, but he was uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew and, uh, in fact, visited Freud. So he was part of the office, uh, the Committee on Public Information, which was the propaganda committee, also known as the Creel Committee on, in Woodrow Wilson's administration. At the end of World War I, Wilson went to the Paris Peace Talks and was greeted as a hero, partly because the CPI did some really good propaganda. And Bernays is like, damn, that really worked. Uh, after, visit, after the Paris Peace Conference, he went to visit his uncle Sigmund, and was leafing through these books, which were not translated into English yet. And so uh, Eddie not only helped translate Sigmund's works into English, but then became the go-to consultant for all of American business uh, to, uh, to basically use, uh, uh, use psychology in business in different ways. And uh, if you watch The Century of the Self, uh, part one, Happiness Machines, uh, the whole hour is basically a biography of Eddie Bernays, including people like Walter Lippmann and others, uh, and explains this story really beautifully. Sorry for the long digression, but this is a, a really important piece of history for me. What's uh, Carl, do you want to explain Drive? Yeah, there, there's a whole uh, whole framework. Uh, we've just gone to a, a, a meeting on Saturday and stuff. So there, it's a it's a pretty comprehensive uh, frame framework. There's six main areas, and then um, twenty eight um, drivers and stuff. But it's all about it's all about what um, we we're just talking about. So there's a whole inventory. Um, process too about motive, you know, what drives and drains you, um, basically. So that's the book behind behind it. Um, I have, I got it. I'm going to be looking. I've got some follow up actions to take from last week to um, get more information about it. So I'll be able to let you know. In upcoming cool. Weeks. Cool. Thank you, um, Mr. Carranza. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, a second to lower that hand. I hear things that concern me. Um, the first was, Stuart, my interpretation of what you were saying is how can we change them? And this is a, a root assumption, seemingly, that you know, they need to change. It is something I struggle with at the root. That sounds very logical. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, Stuart, but but that's what I heard. And, and please, I, I'd like to you know, hear if, if there's a difference there somehow. The second is, <laughs> oh, please, if, if you want. No, I was just gonna say, it's not they need to change, all of us need to change. Everybody on this call needs to change. <laughs> Period. You know, how we live in the world needs to change. You know, um, otherwise it's just going to totally all fall apart. 
And, and, and as Doug earlier said, that might be the best thing that could happen because then we have to rebuild from ground zero. But no, Mark, I, you know, I, I wasn't at all um, othering. I, and my point was that, that the othering is what's getting us all in trouble. All right. Hmm. Um, the second, I, I, I don't know if that's right. I, or, or maybe I don't feel that that's the whole solution in some way. Um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll leave it that there. It's it's certainly, you know, a struggle to say sometimes in a mass situation where there are billions of people on the planet, how to coordinate the choices that affect collectively, um, you know, the, the the health of the entire planet. The second is an assumption about stories. And I've, I've said this before and I'm trying to work on it and, and I don't have that much in terms of you know, great research. But I look at stories as something that is, that, that are, that are very powerful, certainly. But stories are not systems. And if we talk about, um, as Jerry brought up before, you know, the personality as a system. You know, I, I think of street lights are not stories. I mean, stories do affect behavior, but stories aren't behavior. I need to fix my car and a story is not going to fix it. Um, and I hear maybe not from this conversation as much, but we need a better story than them. And that is also a concerning statement where our stories are going to fight and our story's better, so our story's going to win. And I just don't see that as the actual method for change. Um, I don't have solutions, but, you know, I, I hope I'm trying to ask the questions that feel more, much more difficult and engaging to me. And I'll, I'll pass the duck. Thanks for listening. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, just to reflect on what you said about stories for a sec. Um, I'm, I love logic. I think like facts are good. I, you know, uh, I think understanding how a car actually functions makes it much easier to diagnose when you hear a funny sound and when something goes wrong and you're suddenly unable to move forward, et cetera. And I don't think those are stories. Um, I think my, raised awareness on story has come from years of looking at social change, cultural change, and other sorts of things, and realizing that a whole bunch of stories that dominate the arena, that cause a bunch of narratives that come up in people's heads, that cause them to say X instead of Y, are driven by stories, are planted, are, and these stories in many cases are, are, are crafted and planted and retold on purpose. And religions are stories, and very much so. Like religions are big collections of stories uh, in, in some in some large sense. Um, uh, the, the you know the, the the narratives that hold religions are are storytelling, all over the place. That they're they're not, they're not tables. You don't you don't you don't find a lot of religions with tables in them, and decision matrices and uh, uh, flashcards. Like like that that doesn't seem to be the the organizing method for for a lot of religions. Although it would be interesting to start one that did that. Um, and, and if anybody wants to start a religion, I have foobarism.com uh, on the idea, what if what if we invented a placeholder religion? So foobar is a placeholder file name. And so if you want uh, access to edit foobarism.com, tell me, it's a Google site, super easy to edit. I'm happy to give you access. Um, so with that, on to Doug B. Yeah, I, uh, Mark, um, my orientation um, is not to project anything on anyone. 
I think intrinsic to your share is that everything that happens today is attached to an agenda, is an attached to some variation on projection of power control authority or affect and influence over, and usually in service to something. And um, part of the transcending of the, polar the polarization, like giving people uh, an awakening to a bigger space in which the differences become proportionally much smaller relative to the things in common um, is also the idea that um, catalyzing an awakening, a reawakening on a being level, on an experiential level, on an emotional level, on a spiritual level, for each individual is not with any for the purpose of and not with any carry of desire to then do something to them or direct them in some way once they've gotten there. And, and that just, it, it sort of is rooted in a vision of what's the reality I want? The reality I want is that every man, woman, and child on the planet uh, is, has the opportunity to be part of, to contribute, to be valued, acknowledged, heard, and to hear others and to um, realize their individual greatest generative potential for the whole. Like, so, that, so that's the it. And aspirationally, um, it also means transcending um, projecting or asserting anything on anybody in any context and being open and accepting of where they go once they have reawakened to their own generative potential. Like, I don't have a horse in that race. That's not part of anything that I have power control. My power and control stops at my skin. <laughs> so, you know, that there's sort of two shoes to the paradigm shift in that sense. I'll stop there. Mark, did, did Doug just raise questions you'd like to ask? Um, uh, we have a transcript? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I didn't understand how it sounded. Something came across to Doug about it sounded, if I can remember that, um, you know, I'm assuming a polarization between people. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, I think, get more to this wonderful position that Ken has brought up in private conversation that every human being deserves equal access to dignity, belonging, and justice. And these are not stories, but they're systems. They're human systems, they're not technological systems. They're systems that we learn in school. They may have stories behind them, um, but it's a stance that, you know, um, I think I've told this story before. I mean, at, at work we had this um, thing yesterday or the day before where we wanted um, women and non-binary people to meet. And as a worshiper of the sacred androgyny, um, I, I feel as non-binary as, as anybody. Um, and I talked with a, a trans person um, before this meeting and I said, you know, I, I, I wanna show up, but it feels wrong. And they replied, yeah, this male, person tried to go to one of these meetings, male appearing people, and he was barred from entering. And they say, well, we really want females and females who identify as non-binary. Now, this is a digression. I'm sorry. Sorry to go there. This is a, right. um, just kind of a, a story of exclusion, you know, and I'm fine. I think women deserve a space to themselves. I think, you know, it's I, I encountered somebody who used this wonderful term, the label machine. 
Um, I used to be uh, part of a you know group um, of radical folk um, sexually in San Francisco, and um, we called ourselves ambisexuals. We fuck categories, and you know, certainly um, you know the the one of the points is you know don't take this stuff too seriously. Just you know achieve your own generative potential. Um, however however you like and uh if you need support we're here um just you know raise your hand <sighs> sorry for the digression but the shift in values and in behavior and what else what else other than values and behavior? Is it stories? Is it that, um, you know, new technology? Is it um, new ways of starting neighborhood groups or new political systems on the internet that have some kind of, you know, technological agreement backing um, like DAOs, um, we're looking at, at many different things, but to me, it comes down to values and behavior. And starting with common values um, and starting with somehow non, you know, this realization that when I stop at a stoplight, I am giving up my autonomy, my freedom for the the general good for not killing somebody else for not you know crashing my car i mean it's a it's a it's a trade-off that i'm willing to make and as a recent redriver i don't drive too much my god there are nuts on the highway and um, you know, I, just, I came back i was tired i went to bed and i had a dream about bad drivers um i have at the moment, no control, nor do I hope to have the level of Chinese um, technology and artificial intelligence that, you know, I could, you know, pull up my, um, uh, you know, visual, um, uh, thing you know take my virtual finger and click on that driver and you know the um police would get you know an instant video from my car of the bad thing that they did and you know helicopter drones would come in and you know grab that car and fly them off to jail um yeah i, I think that's a little you know techno futurist um fantasy that would be unkind, unfair, and unwise. But yeah, that would be kind of nice to see sometime, you know, <laughs> encountering those bad drivers. Getting back to behavior and values is, and, and what's common, I don't know where to start other than, you know, a real movement to influence schooling of children, but like we're doing here, listening to each other and saying, you know, I value change and I value my autonomy, but there's ways that I'm going to have to change and I'm gonna have to gonna give up part of my autonomy if a collective solution decided by people, mostly not me, is going to say, we think this is the way to do it. We think this is the way to change the collaborative, collective behavior of humanity in a way that we can have a sustainable planet for not only humanity, but the rest of life and nature that you know, is integrated with, you know, the biological beings that we are. Um, 
I'm, I'll, I'll go back to the um, you know uh, transcript later um, because you know it's it's not that important to me. If if Doug, I misunderstood your your understanding of what I was saying previously. That I I think you come here with a good heart and a good mind, um, but it it feels like. Hmm. It feels like we still have a hell of a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, Mark, thank you for the most fascinating digression I've been on in a really long time. That was awesome. Uh, in a couple hours, I will have posted the video, the transcript, and the chat to the town hall, OGM town hall channel on Mattermost. So it will all be there. I wanted to pick up one thing you said about stoplights just to add a little kind of a, to pick up what you're doing and bend it a little bit, which is I'm a big fan of traffic calming that says that stoplights are stupid because we don't act, because they actually increase fatalities and we don't need them. And there's no reason for half the people to be sitting there going, oh, be done, be done, wasting energy. Uh, and that the solution requires people to come into relationship and make eye contact at the intersection so that they can match pace and make their way through the intersection without killing everybody. And that this actually creates the same throughput of an intersection with hospitality and with like like conviviality as a as a nice side benefit, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of stuff there. But some of the narratives in our heads are, well, if we didn't have stoplights, we would kill everybody and everybody would die. And that's been ingrained very, very deeply. And so a lot of things that make a lot of sense socially and with trust don't make sense otherwise and like shock us. So the, you've opened up a, a fun can of worms in my head. So um but this is probably a good place for us to to hit pause on this conversation because you've just taken us lots of different places that uh that i think are, are rich um i thought we had a lot more time sorry no that's all right that's all right we've gone through our 90 minutes that's all uh and and what you said was, was perfect for where we were and what's going on good to see you judy long time You're muted, Judy. Sorry, I mute because of background noises. Yeah, thank yeah you. it's great to listen to this discussion. And I was prompted by Jerry's question what we should talk about and was delighted to tune in and find out we were already talking about it. <laughs> That's great. I love how the world works that way sometimes. Um, so with that, I thank you all. It's a Pleasure to be here. Thanks for digging a little further into this vast network of underground tunnels and tubes, uh, which power the world through the fears of humanity. Who knew that Monsters, Inc. was actually like correct? Um, thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Yep. Ciao. Be on the tubes. Amen. Happy July. Yeah, that's right. <laughs>